Hello everybody. Today we are actually going to be starting a new series. Um, this series is going to go or try to go deeper into the teachings and the person that we know as Mary Magdalene. In my personal life this has been a subject that I have spiritually, emotionally, and mentally been trying to process who was the Magdalene? Who is the Magdalene? Understanding that a lot of this great awakening that we're in right now is the return of the divine feminine. Not in a way that outshines the divine masculine, but in a way that matches the divine masculine. I know that this subject will be hard for a lot of fundamentalist Christians to, to get into. The brainwashing and the control from the church is very heavy and ve very real. But at this point in our awakening, especially since what we're going through is mostly spiritual. And in fact, basically it's all spiritual. All the corruption, everything goes back to this idea of our own spiritual ascension. And when we start to untangle all the cobwebs of mind control and corruption, we have to understand that the Magdalene is a huge part of that and that both her and Yahshua were the Christ. They were the Christ consciousness. They were the divine feminine. They were the divine masculine together. More and more has come out about the truth of who Mary Magdalene really was. For example, we know that she probably wasn't actually from Magdala. I'm not 100% sure on all of this. This is mostly just speculation through my own research. And as far as her roots and her origins, I will probably reveal that research at a later date when I have more concrete information on who Mary Magdalene really was, where she really came from. We understand that Mary Magdalene herself was probably uh, blue-eyed and fair-skinned and fair-haired, which is interesting because we often think about the Middle East uh, people being darker. We know that Yahshua himself was darker, but the fact that the Magdalene was more um, Anglican looking is, is very interesting to me. This brings me back to a lot of my theories that Mary Magdalene was actually Greek coming through the Ptolemy line of Egypt, which again, I will present that when I have a better understanding myself of, of what I have found regarding her actual lineage. Now, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that one of the very first missing books of the Bible that we read was the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which is considered to be a Gnostic Gospel. Now, the Gnostics, again, were the original Christians. They were the Essenes. They were the children of light. And they believed more in this idea of gnosis, or inner knowledge, which really does mirror the teachings of Yahshua and the Magdalene. That God is within you. You, personally, should have your relationship with God. Your relationship with God does not go through the rabbis, or the temples, or the preachers, or the pope. It goes solely through you. In my own studies into the corruption in the Bible, what the Bible really is supposed to say, I have learned that in Genesis 1-3, where it says, God said, let there be light. The original word for light in the Hebrew text meant divine spark. God said, let there be a divine spark. That divine spark is you. So if you are that divine spark, then you are a child of light. You are an Essene. Your relationship with source, with God, whatever you call the Creator, is holy between you and God. No other human being should have any right to that sacred bond. And so as we get deeper into this understanding of the Divine Feminine and of the Magdalene and of the true, complete story of Christ consciousness, I am going to be reading through a book written by Megan Watterson. And this is the Mary Magdalene Revealed the first apostle, her feminist gospel, and the Christianity we haven't tried yet. That's the title of the book. I will put a link to this book down in the description box below if you would like to purchase this book and read along with me. This book came recommended to me by my friend Cindy at Sacred Garden Yoga. I'm going to read you guys the back of the book. It starts off saying the Gospel of Mary Magdalene reveals a very different love story from the one we've come to refer to as Christianity. Harvard-trained theologian Megan Watterson leads us verse by verse through Mary's Gospel to illuminate the powerful teachings it contains. 
a gospel as ancient and authentic as any of the gospels that the Christian Bible contains was buried deep in the Egyptian desert after an edict was sent out in the 4th century to have all copies of it destroyed. Fortunately, some rebel monks were wise enough to refuse, and thanks to their disobedience and spiritual bravery, we have several manuscripts of the only gospel that was written in the name of a woman, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Mary's gospel reveals a radical love that sits at the heart of the Christian story. Her gospel says that we are not sinful. We are not to feel ashamed or unworthy for being human. In fact, our purpose is to be fully human, to be a true human being. That is a person who has remembered that, yes, we are messy, limited ego, and we are also a limitless soul. All we need to do is to turn inward again and again, to meditate like Mary Magdalene in the way her gospel directs us so that we can see past the ego of our own little lives to what's more real and lasting and infinite and already here within. With searing clarity, Watterson explains how and why Mary Magdalene came to be portrayed as the penitent prostitute and relates a more historically and theologically accurate description of who Mary was within the early Christ movement. And she shares how this discovery of Mary's gospel has allowed her to practice and to experience a love that never ends, a love that transforms everything. So for today, we're just going to read a little bit into the introduction. And again, I encourage anybody who wants to move through this with me to go ahead and purchase the book as well so that we can have conversations about it. This will lead us hopefully into a deeper conversation about the priestesshood of Isis, which I know is gonna scare some people because the name Isis has definitely been inverted by the uh, dark players in our world. But hopefully as we start to wake up more and more and more, we'll start to get to the truth of who these people really were and who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So we're going to get into the introduction of Mary Magdalene revealed by Megan Watterson. But before we read that, I want to read you a snippet from the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than all other women. Tell us the words of the Savior that you remember, the things which you know that we don't because we haven't heard them. Mary responded, I will teach you about what is hidden from you. So that again is in the Gospel of Mary. Introduction, the eye of the heart. Pages one through six are missing. Mary Magdalene's gospel starts with missing pages. These are words we can't get back. This is the wisdom, the voice of Christ from the heart of a woman who was torn out and most likely destroyed before the rest of her gospel was buried. There was something so incendiary in these first six pages that her gospel starts on page seven. And there's something poetic about that. Since according to Mary's gospel, seven is the number of stages we need to go through or powers we need to confront within ourselves to reach a clarity or singularity of heart that lets us see past the ego of our own little lives and what's more real and lasting and infinite and already here within us. Three copies of the gospel of Mary have been recovered, two in Greek and one in Coptic. All three versions of her gospel are missing the beginning, and then also four pages in the middle. And those four pages would have contained the answer to what I believe is the most significant question we could ever know. Mary asked Christ, So now, Lord, does a person who sees a vision see it with the soul or with the spirit? All we have of his answer is the provocative yet cryptic start. The Savior answered, a person does not see with the soul or with the spirit, rather the mind, which exists between the two, sees the vision and that is what, and then it ends. Mind, here isn't the modern dualistic concept of the mind that we think of today. It is not mind devoid of body. It's a word that's hard to translate from Greek. It's actually best to keep it in Greek, although the first time I came across it, I thought it was in French. It's nu. New in French means we, spelled N-O-U-S. New in Greek means the eye of the heart. It's the vision or perception of the soul. 
How we see anything changes everything. And there's so much at stake here, which is why her question to Christ is still ours to answer. And which is why perhaps the answer to her brilliant question was torn from her gospel in the first place. Because it would have been revealed to us how we perceive the divine directly from within. What's at stake is spiritual authority. And what I mean by that is both the struggle to determine who has the power to tell Mary Magdalene's story and subsequently the authority to tell the truth about our own story. If how we see, truly see, is not with an eyesight, but with a vision, a form of spiritual perception that allows us to know what's real, what's lasting, and what's actually true, if this comes from within us, then no one has power over us. Simple, right? Yes, and simply revolutionary. For me, these seven powers in Mary's gospel serve as the template of what it means to be human. It's like being handed a road map for the inner terrain. Here are the seven routes the ego can and most likely will take while you're embodied. Here are the places as human beings we get stuck. There are the climates, the states of mind that can compel us to act in ways that are not indicative of who we really are. These are the powers that can silence us from within. I guess this story I'm about to tell you is what the religious scholars would call a conversion story. The Gospel of Mary did convert me, or her Gospel helped me understand why I never felt at home in Christianity that excluded it. From a theological perspective, Mary Magdalene's Gospel is considered an ascent narrative, which means that it describes a path we can navigate to liberate the soul, not in death, but here in this lifetime. The word ascent, though, is misleading, that the imagination immediately goes upward. Think transcendence. Ascension, according to the Gospel of Mary, is more accurately as a descent into the heart. So farther up is actually further in. For me, finding Mary Magdalene's voice meant recovering my own. This is why I've spent the majority of my life studying her Gospel and following her legend through history. I hope in sharing her voice in this book, you will hear the voice of your own soul which might feel lofty and intimidating, I know, but it's just this clear, calm, unassuming voice of love inside you. I also want to clarify that this is going to end the way it began. It is very T.S. Eliot in the four courtlets. And the end all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. It's not about getting somewhere or reaching some place although I will tell you how I ended up perched like a baby goat in yoga gear on the side of a mountain in south of France searching for Mary Magdalene's cave of eggs. The point is Mary's gospel is not to suggest that we need to become someone else, someone better. There isn't this om vibrating version of yourself that you figure out how to be by the end of this book or that I've become by living it. It's about acquiring a vision that allows us to see what has always been there within us. It's about the quality and intensity of our existence. It's about the possibility of actually being present instead of being caught without even realizing it in the endless stories the ego tells from the second we wake up, dividing us from what's already right there, dividing us from each other and ourselves, dividing us from what we consider good or God. It's about really waking up to the fact that our system of understanding the world is no longer serving us. Or so this is how my conversion story goes. I wake up to a way I've been operating in the world, the world created by my ego, and I see the suffering it perpetrates. I see there's another way. And the way does not include finding some hot, saucy pants lover who completes me, not so far anyway, or the discovery of the tried and true receipt for uninterrupted joy, not fame, not success. There's no end point here, no fixed state of contemplation. There is no master or guru status. It's just alpha, then omega. That is what I'm trying to explain. There is no X marks the spot. It's simpler than that and far more difficult. It's more of a series of perpetual moments. When you remember that you don't have to feel separate from love if you don't want to. Even in the midst of the worst of what we say to ourselves, even when someone we love most in the world can't see us at all, we can practice a way that humbles us, that disrupts the ego's grasp and lets us return again with ease, even eventually with levity to love. It's all very quiet and unremarkable though. It's not showy or exciting. 
It's more like this from Elizabeth Gilbert. Never forget that once upon a time, in an unguarded moment, you recognized yourself as your friend. And in that moment of recognition, this is when we save ourselves from the self that was never real to begin with. This is when we see the eye with the heart, which is literally the exact teachings of yoga. So I think for today, I'm going to end it there on the introduction, just so I can give you guys a chance if you want to join in in this reading to get yourself a copy of the book so that you have um, a book to read yourself and to also take notes in. That's what I do in all of my books. I write in all my books. And again, this really does match the teachings that we've been reading through with the Yoga Sutras, that you yourself are enough. And that goes very much against what we've been taught in the traditional uh church. And I kind of know where this is going as far as the truth. Um, I think a lot of what the church has taught us is definitely more of the Luciferian practices, even down to communion being um, cannibalism. So I know that's going to probably ruffle some feathers and that's okay because that's what this great awakening is about. The truth will set you free. And again, Mary Magdalene has been, in, a, in my own personal story, Mary Magdalene has been an entity, a being in my life since I was 16 years old. I will share with you guys, when I was 16, it was, what, 1999, born in 1983. At this point, the internet was slowly creeping up in our lives, so I, I didn't use it for any type of research. And at 16, I probably would not have been researching any biblical stuff anyway. For all I knew, Mary Magdalene was a sex worker that Jesus saved, and she was the one that saw him, the angels after death. I believed the story that the um, dark cult church had told me, the Matrix church, the Cabal church, had told me about Mary Magdalene. And again, I had no other references to her other than that, nor did I really care, to be honest. At 16, I was more interested in the boys in my class than I was with Mary Magdalene. Well, one day I was walking, I'll never forget, I was walking to my French class in the language department in my high school. And my high school was a private school. There was this lake with swans on it. I remember walking by the lake. And the, I think the, rem, the reason why I remember this is that the swans were always really mean. and would kind of chase you, so you always had to kind of be on guard when you were walking past the lake. And all of a sudden, this voice came into my head. It's the same voice that often tells me to do things like read the missing books of the Bible and, you know, go to India. And it just said Mary Magdalene. It's all it said was Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. And it would kind of come into my head over and over and over again. And I never knew why. Why was I thinking about Mary Magdalene? And now flash forward 22 years later, and here I am reading through the missing books of the Bible. And not only that, but I'm starting to realize the personal relationship that I actually do have with the Magdalene. And I think a lot of women have that relationship with the Magdalene. Like her, the Divine Feminine has been shred apart over this post-apocalyptic era we've been living in with the control of the dark cult, the inversion of the Divine Feminine. And so I think that this is going to be a very interesting journey for those of us to go on, if you want to go on this journey with me, to really going back and reviewing Mary's teaching. I will place a link down in the description box below of my original reading through of the Gospel of Mary if you want to listen to that. Some of the opinions that I have in this Gospel might now be different as I, we're going deeper into her story and as I now know more about her and her legacy. Again, I'm hoping that this will bring us to studying more into the priestesshood of Isis, which was the priestesshood of the Magdalene and also the Virgin Mary, the Mother Mary. They didn't teach us that in church, did they? So this is going to be a very interesting, interesting journey, and I hope that like going through the Yoga Sutras, this will help many people empower themselves and take back their own personal relationship with our Creator. Take the power back from the pastors and the preachers and the temple leaders who have perhaps abused you in the past. Take it back, because we are all children of light. I'm thinking that I will be releasing this series on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern time so we can have a regularly scheduled release. Let me know how that sounds to you. And I'm also thinking about going forward with the next few videos. I will actually read this on camera versus doing this as a podcast so I can kind of stop and have discussions with the camera, which hopefully will 
provoke you guys to comment back so we can grow in our understanding together instead of just doing this in a podcast form. So let me know what you think about that too. And once again, I hope you're all having a very, very wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon.